down the hammer and pick up the pencil. You're about to listen to the Savvy Radio Show. Learn from real life real estate investors. Experience revealed with the Savvy Landlord as your host. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls from around the internet, the world, Oklahoma City, Kansas City, Ohio, Chattanooga, you know, East Coast, New Jersey, California. Uh, welcome to the Savvy Radio Show. Man, I'm, I, I just get excited. I think I'm getting older and I get more excited about entrepreneur people than I do real estate. I mean, real estate has been the bulk of my life, more than almost half of my life. But the really cool thing about this, this show is that there is no rules. There's no regulation. There's not like I had to file a HUD or, or a deed of lieu or anything weird. I could just interview anyone. And so it's really crazy to connect with someone they disappear because they're an entrepreneur. They sell their business and then they surface back up through a mini Facebook message. Hey, how are you? Anyway, wh- who I'm about to introduce to you is Ben Rayo from Kansas City. I met this guy. I was trying to figure out exactly at least five, six years ago, this successful entrepreneur uh, at the time, had this company that he was building from scratch. I'm talking about the real deal entrepreneur, ladies and gentlemen. It's hell of work, death, no money, no paycheck, speaking your vision and dream and people laughing at you, trying to get Lowe's to commit to you, Sherwin Williams to say, yes, you can use my brand. People don't know the sacrifices that people make. Well, anyway, this cat made the sacrifices and then he he just... He changed my world and he doesn't even know how. He walks up to me. I, I, just, I just started speaking for the first time. I'm at the Mr. Landlord Conference, probably my third or fourth time speaking. Still nervous, still bumbling over my words, just throwing out content and don't care what people think. And this dude bumps into me. Hey, man, you did a good job. And I was like, who is this? Who's Ben? Like, Ben? Like, that's not even like a... Oh, hi, I'm Ben. And that's the first time I met Ben. And so we've just became Facebook friends. Uh, We would see each other. Ben was on the street of promoting his company at this time called Community Buying Group all over the country. It went went worldwide in my mind, but it went nationwide to every RIA, every convention. This guy was working. People have no idea what it takes. And I just kept running into him. And every time I kept meeting him, we would connect. And then I really connected with him. And he just just loved on me in Ohio at one of my favorite events, which is the Ohio Summit Convention, whatever, landlord, whatever. And I was like, hey, man, I'm doing something in Oklahoma City called Investor Weekend. I'm new. And this guy wrote me a check without even questioning. And I, I just think that that's how entrepreneurs just work. They see other entrepreneurs and they just get excited for them and they believe in their vision. And so I'm honored to have Ben Rayo on the radio show from Kansas City. And so I know that's a very unique, bizarre intro. But that's, <laughs> that's my take on how you changed my little world in Oklahoma City by investing in one of my dreams. And I'm excited to tie in to your new dream and new year vision. But so welcome to the show, my friend. Wow, that's the most amazing uh, introduction I've ever gotten. That's amazing. Well, dude, well, I, mean, I don't, I don't, I, you know, can we just stop the show now? It's just what we, it is. It like, I just want to, you know, in some worlds, drop the panties. I mean, no, I'm just saying. And, I, just, and I totally <laughs> forgot. I totally forgot about the um, the Oria. It was it was Oria. Uh, you were just ball, you were balling. And um, no, dude, listen, stop. Let's just let's paint the picture for these folks. You know. Dude, you had the front booth, triple booth, sponsor, logo everywhere, community buying group dominating thousands of investors in Ohio. And I remember vividly, this is how impactful you are, that you took the time, stepped away from your booth and just loved on me, encouraged me because it was my first time in Ohio promoting Savvy. And, you know, no one knew me. Uh, Vina wouldn't even call my name, <laughs> you know, and you did this for me. You don't even know. You don't even know. I appreciate that. It's you're like, like, you know, it's, um, you're like call I, Vina. I, Wait, hold on, yeah. man. Shut your mouth. Yeah, yeah. You said, you said, call Vina and drop my name. Do you remember that? Yes. And I did. I, I said, hey, Ben Rao, Rao, Rao said, call me. I'm a good speaker. And that's how I got there. 
because of you. So you don't understand like how powerful, you know, you'd like all flip it about it. Like I'm like, my life has changed because of you. All right, that's enough of that. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm just giving you homage. People, listen, whatever this dude has in the future, my, my little fans, friends, this dude's the real deal. So let's get into the real deal, my friend. Stuart, so how, how long have you been an entrepreneur? Do you remember the time when you said, you know, I was selling candy illegally in the school halls called Jolly Ranchers for a quarter? I was taking toothpicks and soaking them with cinnamon oil and <laughs> selling them for like five for a quarter. You could suck wow. on that toothpick all day. Yeah, it would Dude, burn your so mouth cool. up. Dude, you've yeah. got you you got you got to write a book now. Yep, that was middle school, man. I was selling toothpicks. Uh, but you know, buy buy a buy a pack of I hear the jolly buy a pack of Jolly Ranchers or Starburst. Break that pack up. Cost a good soul fifty cents. <laughs> sell them sell them for two for a quarter. You make you, an you, extra dollar, get a soda and a bag of chips at the end of the day, no extra cost, pay for your cost of goods. It was, yes. And, and I, that was, you know, as a kid, I was the kid in the neighborhood that one was relatively irritating because I, I would have such an active mind. I thought at one point when I was a kid, I grew up on a great street. There was lots of families and I was always excited about it. I thought I was going to play the trumpet at one point. So I was taking trumpet lessons and this is how bad it was. I would wake up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning and my parents to the point were like, we got to get this kid a TV and we got to get our TV for his room and put a box of dried fruit or cereal on a TV so he does not come out of his room at 5 o'clock to w start waking us up. I wandered into the front yard one day with my trumpet at about 6 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning. It's like, I'm going to sit in the front yard and practice. How fun is this going to be? You know? And, and then so neighbors shut up get wow. out of the what, what was your what you were just practicing because you were driven practicing. yeah uh I, I didn't stick with the trumpet um <laughs> I, I did sing in the boys choir uh for a while um but i grew up in louisville kentucky great city great great city i i had what i consider to be the picture perfect childhood hmm. my parents divorced when i was three they stayed great friends my mother met another man who became my stepfather and I got the opportunity to be raised by two men um, that both loved me and respected each other. And there was never any animosity, any of the other stuff that you hear kids having to go through. Um, my stepfather was in the thoroughbred business. He was a literally a rock star lead singer in a, in, in a band that was very famous in Louisville for many years. And so, and he owned several bars and my father was a salesperson and kind of moved up to be president of a computer company. And so, I really had two different role models that were very interesting, but both of them entrepreneurial and hustlers in their own way. Hmm. Um, and so I, I had great role models. My mom was a hard worker and um, always was, she was very underpaid until she was about, about 55 to 60 years old where she decided to take a, a higher position that she could have easily done 30 years previously. So uh, grew up, uh, stayed in trouble all the time as a kid, bored. Um, just got myself into, into all kinds of things, but I was the neighborhood organizer. So we had 13 kids and I would go door to door and say, you want to play, kick the can? Well, I'll play if so-and-so plays. So then I just started telling everybody that everybody else was playing. And next thing you know, we had 10 plus kids in the street, kick the can, and that was going on all the time. So picture perfect, you know, went to university of Kentucky after, uh, after high school, graduated with a degree, home economics, baby. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I changed majors oh three God. times. Yeah, interior design, photography. Finally got out. So, okay, great, that's great where the creativity comes in. Because I'm like, all your stuff is always clean and legit. Okay, keep going. Home, home yeah. economics degree. Wow, like you're like a man's man in my mind. Like I just don't see you with an apron on trying oh, to. Oh yeah. Well, apron <laughs> well, with no trumpet. pants. Apron with no pants. <laughs> yeah, like on a motorcycle somewhere. <laughs> all right, so. Okay, so, so University college. Of Kentucky, um, got out of school and got my first job in corporate America uh, as a sales rep and started what, what working industry? hard. What, what uh, industry? I was selling recording equipment to offices, so uh, digital dictation and transcription equipment. So back in the 90s, used to have micro cassettes that were like regular cassettes and a handheld the size of one of our phones attorneys, doctors, recording. So imagine me, 22 years old, I'm knocking on the door of a, of a medical practice, 
trying to get in to see the doctor. Well, you ever been to a doctor's office? The doctors are busy. So yeah. I hustled and did really well in Lexington, Kentucky, and took, then took a promotion and went to Cincinnati, and I became the downtown metro rep. So now I'm calling high rises, big companies. I'm crushing it there. I got great mentors in the company, great sales manager, people teaching me. Lanier was the name of the company, uh, about 8,000 people. They, they, they're really big in the copier, I think, now. Um, then I got the opportunity to go to St. Louis for an interview. And I'd never been to St. Louis before, and I became a, to, for a healthcare rep position. And I truly believe I got, I did a lot of hard work, and I was hustling, but I, did, I got the job. I remember that day so vividly. I had I'd gone out and ridden with like five or six of their reps. Like I was kind of a manager, but I was trying to see what's going on in the territory. I'm now going to try to get a position where I call them big hospitals where they're buying systems for a few hundred thousand dollars. At the end of the day, the sales manager is taking me back to the airport and we're riding there and we're talking. And I said, so what do you think? Are you going to hire me? <laughs> he just looked at me like a deer in the headlights and said, did you just try to close me to get hired? And I knew with his personality, because he was kind of a hard closer kind of type guy, he was like, I knew I had him. He just smiled from ear to ear. He put me back on the plane. By the time I was on the ground, my manager had already gotten a phone call from him. Hey, Ben, pack your stuff up. You're moving to St. Louis next week. Wow. I packed my stuff up. I drove to St. Louis. I lived at a hotel for a week or two until I found an apartment. Knew no one out, out in St. Louis and, and did that. And, had, and it was the number three sales rep in the United States that following year for healthcare reps out of about 200 reps. So I had a great, great career. I took who my wife is, Rhonda, today. We've been together for 20 plus years. I took her on the incentive trip to San Juan. So, the, so the, the, uh, back then, you know, it was like, okay, all the top reps, we're going, on a, we're going on a trip to San Juan. You can bring your spouses. Rhonda and I weren't married yet. We were to be married the following week. We were engaged. She paid for her own flight down there. So I took her down. We had a great time. Came back. Manager calls me in the office. Ben? Yes? This is a hard conversation for me to have, but I'm going to have to fire you because we have a strict policy that you can only bring your spouse on these trips. I said, well, we got married Tuesday. Well, that's after the fact, and I don't have a choice. We're too big of a company and HR, so you're fired. Wow. Thank you for your service. And you know what? I looked at it and said, hey, that was on me. I, I, I crossed the line. I broke a rule that they had. It was totally on me. I wasn't going to say, you know, what a crappy company. I'd done great. I'd made really, really good money. And so if you think back in the, in the mid to late 90s, you know, making six-figure plus income doing that is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. sure. I took about 30 days off. I called my dad. I said, hey, Pop, what are you doing up there in, in New Jersey? And he'd been a sales rep and moved all the way up to be the president of a pretty good-sized company. And then they kind of dissolved the company, uh, all the sales reps, and he was brokering computer equipment. And then I said, well, I'll do that in St. Louis. For 10 years, we built that company to 30 employees and became a premier IBM business partner. And I sold large technology to big companies, anything from a $50,000 server to a multi-million dollar server and all kinds of things that will go along with it. Enjoyed that in St. Louis. Went on a trip to Jamaica with my wife, Rhonda, and met this incredible couple in Jamaica who lived in Lee Summit, Missouri, which is outside of Kansas City. And we decided to move to Lee Summit as we'd spent three or four years being best friends with them and doing trips. And so that's what got me to Kansas City. And he and I started buying properties together. And I love the rehab aspect in just the design. And we started flipping them and holding them. And so he and I have about 40 rental properties still um, in the, in the, Eastern Jackson County, which is on the east side of Kansas City and Missouri. So that that's um, wow. I mean, you know, so it really went from corporate sales to technology to real estate, which I'd had a few rental properties along the way on my own. And you know, you know, my first property was a condo that I bought. I rented out the bedrooms to other guys that were in their early twenties. That you know, I got my mortgage paid for by somebody else, right? Isn't that the, isn't that the best, right? That's the cash flow. Yeah, model. I mean, I'm I'm just I'm enthralled by 
you know, you have, here's the two thoughts that came to my mind. One, you seem like a free spirit guy that you were willing to travel to move, which is kind of rare in some regard, but you were young, but then you were a very driven individual. And then, so I, I would love to know what's your take on how did you become driven? What's your, what's your goal behind being driven? Cause like top sales, is it accolades? Is it the economics? Is it the paycheck? You know, it's, I think it's a combination of, you, you, you ever do the uh, love languages? Yes. The five love languages. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I, I'm not, um, gifts doesn't get me, um, you know, I do, you know, physical touch is, is good. You know, I think, I think that there's some accolades there that I kind of, it's kind of my own ego and I don't realize it's like, I like being recognized as being successful. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel good about myself, which probably goes back to some deep, dark, something that happened in my childhood that I need approval. We, we all have it. That, so, that, uh, you know, I'm looking for approval from other people and, mm. you know, what are people thinking about? And, uh, the, you know, I've always found myself to be driven. I think both my parents were driven, so I wish I could take more recognition for that. But I think they're both definitely driven in their own way. Um, I don't mind work. Work is fun. I don't feel like I've ever worked. I mean, for 20 years. I don't feel like I've worked. Well, the, the thing is, is like you have all this vigor now, and but a lot of people don't know what it takes to be an entrepreneur. I mean, I know when you started Community Buying Group, I mean, it was um, no one never heard of. Who, who, do, who could organize all these cycle landlords together in a community <laughs> and give them discounts and have a network? Because the, the only reason why that's funny to you, but let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why we have so many problems in the landlord industry is because we're segmented because they're passing laws in Ohio that are affecting laws in Oklahoma, but we don't band together as a unified group. So we have no power. We have no lot. We have no lobbying. And so what Ben has done has tried to organize just like you as a child, organize the neighborhood, which is the neighborhood <laughs> of landlords to have a powerful source. And you did it. You convinced Lowe's, you convinced Sherman Williams, Hey, this is an untapped market of thousands and thousands of landlords that spend tens of that. I know, I mean like hundreds, I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on rehabbing properties at one time in my career. Yeah. Yeah. But before, thing, uh, be before I sold that company at the end of 17, we were, we, we had over 15,000 members and you know, it's a, it's interesting. All from my zeros life, from z you had 15,000 people. I was one of those little 15,000. I know. And local RIA group had your banner on there with your name on it. Yeah, I made a lot of mistakes, um, and and that's how you know that's a lot about what you learn you learn from. But I would tell people to pay attention to what's going on around you in your life in your current business, because there's opportunities that are going to come across in front of you. And I don't mean like everything's a shiny opportunity. I just mean if you pay attention, things tend in my life have always kind of cycle back. So when I worked for Lanier and I made it through to the point of being a healthcare and a, and a hospital rep, that was at the point in time when hospitals were all making a heavy push to consolidate, to come together and they were being bought by other companies and that they had GPOs or group purchasing organizations because they were trying to leverage their buying power to say, look, we're 25 hospitals, we're a hundred hospitals, we're all buying gloves and syringes and gowns. Hmm. Let's come together so cool. we can get better pricing. So that's how that's how that all transpired. That was that was five years, six years before. So that's so cool. You, so you just and I think that's my success today. Like I was successful in the bridal world because I applied everything I learned in the rock and roll world as a promoter and as a as a manager of bands. I just applied all that concept to the bridal world, and you know I think that's that's phenomenal. Here's a question that I have. Tell me. Where did you become an entrepreneur? I mean, you were a corporate man. I mean, you you have a corporate image. When I saw your booth at, in Ohio, your your you have which is you're blessed in my mind because I'm straight ghetto, dirty entrepreneur like from the trenches. Uh, random yeah, success. but you love that. You love. But that. I don't. I don't have this corporate mentality. My wife does. She constantly has to remind me. She's she constantly reminds me like this is how society works. She worked in a hospital, but like in your mind, like you you went to school, you got a degree. You had two solid men and figures that had, you know, the drive. I get the drive. I get the success. How, 
I think, how did you become an entrepreneur? Like, where did it change on you? Because you had a $100,000 a year job plus selling doctors, you get free meals, you get a lot of fun stuff, you get to travel, you get board meetings that are a waste of time. I get it. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty simple job, not a simple job. It's a complicated job because you have to learn a lot of lingo and you have a lot of quotas and you have, you have some 60 hour week, 70 hour week pressure. But where did the, where did the entrepreneurism, I mean, obviously from childbirth, you, you were selling freaking cinnamon sticks. I mean, that's just hysterical. I've never heard it. You know, I'm down. But the thing is, it's like, where did it just snap for you where you're like, all right, mother, I'm going all in. And were you fearful? Uh, I mean, you were living a $100,000 lifestyle. All of a sudden, you're making no money, giving it all to this. And you, you're pouring every dollar into the community buying group. Yeah. I mean, you wrote me a $1,000 check, dude. I mean, I know. I mean, you were just getting momentum when we connected thoroughly. But what's your mindset? How, what, what, yes. what drove you to this point? What book did you read? What person slapped you in the face and told you this is the route you should go? Right. So, entrepreneur? So, you know, you, you like, you've hit like three or four areas. I mean, I mean mindset is a big part of it. Um, you know, my stepfather was a really, really interesting individual. Um, I mean, even when I was a kid, I was critiquing like, you've got a restaurant you've got to keep these bathrooms spotless, man. This is like a big impact for like one of the check boxes. And that just wasn't the kind of guy he was. Mm. Right. Okay. Um, and, and I was looking at stuff like that, but I, I think the encouragement that I always got from my parents to say, you can do anything that you want. Come on. Um, and so that was, and he was always like, if you're going to do something, do it good. Come on. And don't, don't, you know, you know, get out. It was like, get out and get after it and go, go, go be somebody. If you're going to be a watchmaker, be the best watchmaker. If you're going to do this, do this. So he was always encouraging in, in a very, very creative and interesting way. Um, cool. I okay. think I've always had a mindset. Uh, so many people are worried about what if. And I start with things like, hey, right now in my life, I'm taking a risk on a couple of new ventures and it's eating up time. Time is all we have, right? We can only... The only thing we have is time. Screw money. You can always go make more money. You can't ever get time back. So you need to be doing what you want to do in your life, being happy. You need to spend the time with your family if that's what's important to you, and that's important to me. And I was a great father and enjoyed spending time with my family, and they were the, they were the most important thing. I loved working, but the mindset's always been, what's the worst thing that can happen? What if all this fails? What happens? Hmm. Are they going to take my wife away? Are they going to take my kids away? Are they going to take my dogs away? Or, you know, what, what could happen? What, I, what, my family and I are going to go live in a trailer somewhere or something? Come on. That might be the best thing that could ever happen to my life, you know, the, if from a re- relationship perspective. So it's like, I think so many people are worried about, oh my gosh, because I always felt like you could always go out and go make some more money. You could always go out and go do something. Right. So, it, doesn't, it doesn't define who you are. It doesn't. And, and I think people are scared to make mistakes. And man, I have made so many mistakes. Yeah. Both on, oh, yeah, you know, right. and it, um, you know, you talk about the, the success of community buying group when I started it, and that was in a garage of a rental property. And the model pivoted three times before I even kind of got it figured out. You know, it's like, yeah. I'm gonna, it, it makes all the sense in the world to go do that. And, and then, and then I had, I had something that really was not, I, I'm trying to be careful about how I say this, but um, Lowe's is a big company. Mm-hmm. And Lowe's, Lowe's let about 4,000 people go, including a bunch of people out of their national account team. And Lowe's was a big percentage of our revenue at Community Buying Group at the time. Community Buying Group's model was I would assemble all of these people that were small businesses, bring them together. And I kind of learned about that when I did the rehabbing with Sean to say, you know what, there's, there's millions of people out there like me that are out there doing this and spending $300,000 a year, $100,000 a year, $20,000 a year how can we get these people together and organize in some platform so that we can go get better pricing? And it's a great value to the supplier because we're aggregating people to spend more money and be more loyal. Lowe's let all those people go. It really, really fragmented their national account team and program and what happened. And we were on a list of people that said, sorry, community buying group, we're not going to continue with your program. Hmm. I had 12 employees at, I'm sorry, 18 employees at the time. And I let 12 people go the next day because Lowe's was such a big percentage of our revenue at the time. And it had been getting less and less. 
And that was hard. Um, it's hard to let good people go that didn't do anything wrong. And fortunately for, for me, they all understood that, hey, Ben, this wasn't something that you could have probably done anything about, which I still disagree that there probably there's things I could have done from a standpoint of maybe for the previous two years before I should have had more relationships with more people throughout the organization. You can always second guess it. Um, so Lowe's said that's it. Um, big company says uh, maybe we don't need to follow all the T's and C's of the contract that I had at the time. And I said, well, guys, you still have to give me some runway. That's our contract says that. And all, all said and done, um, it wasn't very ugly, but it took, it took three or four months to kind of get everything settled with Lowe's before we shut it down and make sure we got paid everything we were supposed to get paid. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had to go to a route to hire attorneys and go to the arbitration, but I just was not going to let Lowe's roll over on a small company. And at the time, and I don't blame Lowe's as a corporation, this is just people making decisions that they had to make. But it was a principle that I just wouldn't allow myself to say, I'm not going to not fight. I didn't do anything wrong. We were doing everything right. Um, we, yeah. we, we ramped that up to $80 million in spending for Lowe's. Um, yeah, which, which we were getting a percentage bogus. of. I, I remember this was going down. I was just a silent guy in the back room just watching you deal with this. And, you know, I, you know, I, I just, it's just frustrating and dumb because they just lost all that revenue and organization and like everyone just hopped over to Home Depot. I mean, it's like. Well, they did lose a big part of it. And, you know, many people know Home, Home Depot is difficult to do a relationship with them and they've got a lot of initiatives. And, you know, that kind of, that kind of jaded me a little bit. Um, we still had a great relationship with Sherwin Williams and National Real Estate Insurance Group and Sunbelt Tool Rental. And so there was still significant revenue there through those other relationships. But yeah. I just was like. You built all this <laughs> up and then the rug and, and, got swooped up from under. I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, it's the real deal. You need to be on TV. I mean, it's the real deal entrepreneur. Like, I mean, you put your whole every ounce, every your wife, years. everything. I mean, people, I can't articulate, guys. I'm an, I've been an entrepreneur for so long. It's just natural that I don't get a paycheck. <laughs> like, like I just do stuff all day and like, oh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't get paid, you know. But the thing is, is like when this was going on, did you sell the business after that? All, all the I hell did, that you I did. Um, yeah, so let's so, talk about that. Like, so w were you just so, broken as a person? Uh, no, no, I, actually... Actually, that's one of the things that I, I'm pretty resilient and kind of like, well, I mean, it's time to move on to the next thing. Um, we were, you know, it, it's just... So, was uh, that your mom? It's like, that no, was your mom no, speaking no, in there. <laughs> no, not really. It was just... It's time uh, to move on. What are, what are we going to do? You know, so when I got fired from Lanier, I took 30 days off. I was like, hey, it's kind of on me. I think if we all take a little bit of responsibility for what's going on and I don't mean beat yourself up, but it's like, um, and if you can take the, if you can take the sentiment of, okay, Lowe's is a, is an $87 billion company. They got things to do. And even though we did a lot, it's a spec in the, in their world of what is their agenda as a company and a corporation. So mm. I, you know, I can't take that personally. That's decisions they're, they're making. So I'd had a great relationship with think realty which was a company out of Kansas City that's a media company and does events um, all, over the, all over the United States. And they still do that. And they bought Community Buying Group um, to roll in all the benefits programs into their Think Realty. And they're still there. So you can still join Think Realty. And I think you can join, you, there's a level that you can join for free and you know, get discounts at Sherwin-Williams and get access cool. to other things. Um, it's, co it's cool that it, it was passed on, you know, and it's still, still viable. People still use it. And it's what yeah, it is. If you're passionate about your business, and I would say one of the things that I'm good at is knowing your numbers. And so building out a multi-year performa that talks about what your revenues, quantities, what you're going to do over a period of three to five years, and what your expenses are during those, and you're ramping them up, and variable expenses are growing, and you've got all your things from rent and insurance and employees and all the things that you need to do that. That's a really great model for anybody building any business. And you talked about, you like, hey, I'd love to have you on the show as an entrepreneur, even though you've got real estate experience. It's like all businesses have the same thing. They have a mm -hmm. product that they sell for money, that they've got expenses, and they've got the same things they're dealing with. Taxes, people, uh, personalities, 
all those different things, and that's just a P&L. So for me, it all starts with how do you build out a five-year performa that's very detailed month by month on the business and see if it even makes sense before you do it for two years and say, I shouldn't have done that. I just lost two years. Now we're back to the time. I lost two years of my life doing something because I didn't want to spend three hours to build something out. Mm. It's ridiculous the amount of businesses. But So powerful. Before I sold. Well, hold on. Dude, before, let's, just give, let's, just, let's marinate on what you just said. Basically, that we before you venture off and buying another house or starting a business, and you know, this is crazy because this is exactly where I am right now. This is this transition, and I'm listening to a book called from Pat Flynn called Will It Fly? And asking the hard questions and doing the raw data and doing the spreadsheet and doing the performance is this going to bring me where I want to be? And is this in line to my goals and dreams? And we just a like you said, just three hours of preparation of where it's going, is it going to deliver what I want it to happen? Or am I just doing it out of arrogance because people know me? Is it, is it, if I, you know, that's why I'm like, I'm not really down to speak everywhere anymore because I, it takes away from my family. That's against what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, I have little babies. I'm trying to stay there with them. That's why I like Zoom and why we could do this over the phone. Even though I would love to go to Kansas City, if it was 1970s, and I'd have to interview you with your little you could take the train you, over. You could do your little recorder that you sold me, at, yeah. you know, the the little mini cassette, and and then then. But the cool thing is, I think, guys, friends, listeners, at all stages of your life, this what this man just said is extremely powerful, and I, I'm dragging this out for a specific reason. So you need to marinate on this. And at 46 years old. Several businesses successful in my t- in my world. Several that have crashed and burned. And the the leading cause is if I just sat down and just really marinate on the business plan, think about where it's going to be three five years. What's the worst thing that could happen? And before we launch into something, because we're all excited about making business cards. We're all excited about making logos. We're all excited about the <laughs> website. And we never even tested it or even know if it's a viable business. Does so, anybody even want the product I'm about to sell? Have you surveyed some people? You know, I love what you just said because that is, and we're going to get to what kind of some of the stuff I'm involved in after selling the business. And that's, yeah. that's about helping other entrepreneurs and building stuff out. But you see people, the first thing they say is, I got a URL, I got a card, and I got a logo. And I'm like, well, let's talk about, Let's talk about what the next three to five years looks like. How about capital? How many, how many you're going to sell and what's your cost and what that looks like. And everybody's like, well, I, here's my three-year numbers. It's like, well, great. Let's shift from that because what that Performa does for you is it gives you a foundation to then build your marketing plan that backs into your Performa that allows you to say, here's my marketing plan to go get these numbers because that's the next question. And there's lots of people in every city where you're listening, I would say, go out and find, Kansas City is huge for entrepreneurship. They're known for it. The Kauffman Foundation is here. Mm. It's worldwide. But uh, there's, there's a, they, they have something called Million Cups, and they're in almost every city across the United States. Yes, we have it's it here. Wednesday mornings. That's a great place to network with other entrepreneurs. You know, local RIA groups are great to connect with people in real estate. You're building a real estate business. Mm-hmm. So. You Come need on. to run the business. The real estate is just the function of the business of what kind of business right. you're doing. So that Performa, this is a spreadsheet with 60 columns, January through December times five. The top half is all your income. The bottom half is all your expenses. And then you have a section in it that I call cash flow or debt. So if you have to service debt, maybe you put money on a credit card, but you know the business has to say, I got to pay $1,000 a month. That's got to come out. You care about your cash flow to make sure that you can survive long enough to make money. We made no money with Community Buying Group for the first 18 months, all self-funded from deals I'd done in technology. Hmm. Then okay, I brought awesome. in a couple hundred thousand dollar investor to they say, well, I've proven it. Let's, let's, before we get into what the new venture that you're doing that I'm really excited about, and, and guys, that's why I have been on the, on the show. I like to bring new things. I'm all into technology. And Ben's about to break off his new way to get leads for you real estate investors like me uh, in hey, a you segment. You stepped over one thing, though. I got to talk about bridge space before. So okay, okay, okay. okay. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Well, I copied that and I failed and I didn't want to bring that up. So, right. so let me preface right. it for you. So anyway, Ben, ben took a leap of faith and bought this building downtown and turned it into a co-working space, right? Yeah, so, so old post office. So when I sold the company, 
this was kind of where I was headed. And I bought a 14,000 square foot building, gutted it. I'm like, how hard could it be to do a commercial deal? It can't be hard. Good I've luck. done 50 plus rehabs. This is a piece of cake. It handed me my lunch. Mm -hmm. It just destroyed me. I mean, I was $300,000 over budget. It was ridiculous. Uh, but I was able to buy the building, got it. It was about a $2 million project. Um, and I was able to do historic tax preservation credits, which means you get federal and state credits based on all the qualified expenses. So if you think about $1.7 million in expenses that are qualified, then I was able to get 25% of that number as state credits and 20% wow. of that number as federal. So, Savvy. Yeah, I love so it. And you can sell the state credits, but then the IRS wants to show his income. So, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, there's banks that buy these credits for about 92 cents on the dollar. And then they're turning around selling them for 95 cents and, and tweening the, the difference. But they're buying, you know, hundreds of millions of them. So they're making big money doing that. So that's a great wow. way to kind of back end it. Um, when I did get short on money, I had to go raise cash. I had about 60 days to go raise $400,000 because of the overages. Part of the overages were because it's put a fixed existing roof for 40 or put a new one on for 140. Yeah. We'll put a new one on because I, get I never want to fix it again <laughs> and I'll never have to fix it again. Um, man, you're so, such an entrepreneur, man. You, but that you was were... a passion project too. Cause it was almost like, it was almost like taking all the different stuff I've done. There's like, these are like mini rental properties because we have 35 private offices inside the building. And then I have meeting rooms and event space. And all of that is under one roof in the downtown business district, which has the walkability to go to 20 restaurants. Downtown Lee Summit is this killer little eight block space. So it was like all these things came together. I was really involved. <laughs> in my it's so cool because I, I've watched you from afar. I, I saw this unfold on um, Facebook and I'm like, you're the first one that pulled the trigger. I actually copied you and did an entrepreneur space and crash and burn real fast because I didn't do any research, just like you said three minutes ago. But my question <laughs> is when you, when you you know, propose this to the, to the community, business community of sorts, of downtown, Kansas, did you get any kind of rejection or objection? Like, oh, that's never gonna fly. I mean, this is a pretty decent sized project to not to fail on. So, yeah. and it's huge. So now I saw, I saw pictures of you with like a bunch of people and you got some award and you have these cool lunches. And I mean, it's, we had 10,000 people through the building the first 14 months, 10,000 people. Yeah. I mean, you, you got that on lockdown. It's, a, it's marketing. about marketing and driving people through and providing value. And so we do business coaching for companies and yes. it's free. I uh, saw that too. Like yes. four or five sessions uh, a month. We bring in a subject matter expert could be, how to make money on Instagram or how to set up a performa or how to set up an LLC or the risks that you need to talk about a CPA. So all these different resources, we do that for free. Okay. It's free, but it brings 20 to hundred people through the building. That's 500 people a month. And then having a lot of community events, we donated almost $60,000 last year um, to philanthropies through space yeah, and time that we did with our, with our small crew here where we allow them to have events here so they can do fundraisers or board meetings. And again, that's a community, somewhat selfish in some ways, because I want to give back to the community, but it also brings high level people in my community through my space. Dude. So different, different tactics um, like that to bring people through. Um, Man, I you gotta be, I got, I got, you got to be juiced up. I mean, you're just flippantly, I'm like, I'm taking notes. I'm like, I'm going to start doing this in Oklahoma City. I'm like, that's it. I should have called your ass a long time ago, and I didn't because I was weak. But I'm like, dude, this business community, so, yeah, so really, I approached it from a standpoint, say, I'm building this as a community resource to try to lift up small businesses and give them the resources they need. We also have a podcast studio and a video studio and all the connectivity between a couple hundred businesses being in the same building and just the, the organic nature of people having these collisions to do business together. But you're, you're facilitating it, you know, facilitating the space for the community. Um, I was able to get some tax incentives from my local community as well through, mm. um, they had, they had deemed the building blighted, even though we're in a very, very affluent area, but the building had sat empty for three years, um, as an old post office, because nobody could make the numbers work to tear it down and build apartments or do something else. So, um, there's, you know, I had to get really creative to make it, I could have never done it. And really it was like, okay, this is my give back to the community. I went from, 15 to 20,000 people all over the country to hyper-focused. Now I'm focused in a 10 mile radius of my building. And I live in the downtown business district where, where the business is. And that's another thing. Hey man, if you're looking for quality of life, 
my commute has been six blocks and I cut my commute to three blocks two years ago from where I work. Cool. And that gives me the ability for my kids and family to stop in and see me anytime. Um, you know, really connected to my local community and it's a quality of life that I've chosen that I want to have. I've refused awesome. the ability to work for other people and make a lot more money because I want to live my life the way that I want to live my life. And so bridge space, and you can see the bridgespace.us. There's photos in a virtual walkthrough there or on Facebook. You'll see some stuff. It's a really neat, it's a, it's a totally passion project. I, I spent $20,000 on artists to come in and do murals and do different things. We did the first mural on the side of our other building downtown. So when you talk about building a business, you better be committed mm -hmm. to whatever it is that you're doing. And again, that was building on rental properties. Okay, that's sort of like renting an office. Um, you know, rehabbing properties, that's like rehabbing a, a property there. And I already cared about the community and we have a great thing going on in downtown. And so it all played into that. And that really gave me a platform to meet hundreds of business leaders and be a thought leader in Kansas City because people saw what I was doing. And it opened a lot of doors for me to have other conversations, uh, including a company that I'm doing some, it started with a consulting gig and I've now become a partner in that is in the long ter term care insurance space. So, which is interesting. They work in long term talk loss, easy for me to say, long term, -term care. care insurance claims and they help people where insurance companies aren't paying their claims to assemble all the medical records and help them to get paid so they can get moved into a long term care facility. So that, that became, I got involved in that because of all the stuff I did at Community Buying Group, marketing, technology, all the stuff we did there laid perfectly over their model where I could see I could create exponential value and 10x the business based on the knowledge and experience I had at Community Buying Group. So when we talk about everything is building on something else, that's cool. kind of what got me to that company yeah. because it was another business. Bridge Space was never scalable from a standpoint of making any significant money, right? right. It was great for the community. Great. I could make some money. But the, but the long-term care is a national model where there are millions of people that are customers. That need help. That was, that was where I decided to start spending my time, which got my phone to ring by a real estate investor in St. Louis by the name of Philip Vincent. And Philip was doing what any hustler would do. He's out calling people in the same industry to make connections because he, want, he had a big idea and he was trying to figure out how to get it off the ground. And it was just an absolute perfect. Well, what's, this, what's the name of? Well, first of all, what, we're, what Ben's about to talk about is, and especially in my market, this is an, an ingenious idea. And I'm, I'm just excited to be on the forefront of it. But where do we get leads today? I mean, bandit signs, direct mail, billboards, blah, Google blah, blah, words, blah, blah, right. blah, 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 blah. And there's a million and one people, but no one's doing what Ben is about to discuss. We're about to discuss and tell us what it is. And it's in that space of uh, assisted living or uh, retiring or old yeah, people. So, <laughs> so this is really interesting. And again, just like fundamentally, you know, sometimes, I shouldn't say sometimes in my life, I have always felt a gravitational pull towards certain things. And this just absolutely things are hurtling at me. Um, and you know, I'm trying to block stuff with a shield. It's coming at me so fast. Um, learning about the long-term care space with the insurance company really gave me the opportunity to understand the industry, which is totally, totally whack. Mm. I mean, um, senior living uh, industry is so fragmented and just so disorganized and whack. It is, they're not regulated like a medical hospital is. And it's just, it's, it, it is why it is the wild, wild west. And Philip called me just in a networking and we got a conversation over a period of six months, we really created a relationship and decided to become business partners to create a new venture called mom's house. So momshouse.com. And what we're doing is teaching real estate investors how to go out and have conversations with people in the long-term care industry to be able to create high quality leads. And why would we know about this? Because for the last eight to nine years, Philip has been out in St. Louis and he's developed relationships with senior care facilities, with placement agents, with home health care, with home care agents all over St. Louis 
and he is doing more than 50 deals a year that are being referred to him without any marketing expense. Wow. He just got a referral last week from somebody that sent him a customer that had three houses to sell. And so he's been going out. He's, he's made a tremendous amount of mistakes. And, and we have taken everything he's done for the last eight years and we have built a two day course that we are taking real estate investors through so they can open up this new channel for leads in their territory. And the beauty is think about postcards. If you're listening, if you're doing postcards, you're doing Google ads, you're doing something else and you get a lead and you close it. How many more leads do you get from that postcard or that particular Google mm, ad? Come on. Or, I hear this. Come zero. on. Zero. This is a reoccurring opportunity to create leads that keep coming in with little to no marketing expense year after year. Hmm. So Philip, we've taken everything he's, he's been doing. We've put it into a two day course. And what we are doing is we're teaching a select number of real estate investors. We're not looking for somebody that's new in real estate. We're looking for people they have an appetite to grow their business that have experience and know how to do deals and that we can open up a new channel where there's less competition. The buyer is highly motivated because they have to sell the house to be able to move into a long-term care facility. But the husband died eight years before the mom. They've done nothing to the house. The house needs a ton of work. Both adult children live in other cities somewhere in the United States. And now they're trying to deal with my mom fell for the third time. She's got to move into a community. We've got to do something with the house to sell it because we need the money to be able to put her in a, in a facility. Mm -hmm. These facilities are anywhere from two to $6,000 a month. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I think the average cost is almost $75,000 a year. So we're teaching people to do this. And we have a very exciting phase two that we're working on that we hope to roll out before the end of the year. So anybody that's interested in mom's house, and we need to get Philip on your show. You need yeah, to absolutely. Because Philip has got like one, he's extremely fun to have on uh, to talk to because he's animated and excited, uh, <laughs> much like much like you are. But uh, <laughs> you know, he would love to come on and share. Yeah, details. I'm, I'm excited. I mean, your track record proves um, your your worth is in salt. You know, I mean, everything. We sold five markets last week. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. I mean, I, you know, if you're you're, you're listening anywhere in the country right now. Think of it like a franchise. This is an opportunity, ground floor opportunity um, to help you get more leads. You know, whatever you do, you got to focus on. And I, I think this is a segment of, of older people. I, I'm getting older. I'm 46 years old. I know um, that, you it know. It's the largest emerging market in our country. Yeah. And there's 300,000 people going into care facilities a year, of which more than 50% of them own homes. That's awesome, man. Yeah. And I, I mean, it, I know it works. I mean, I just said a J just, just relational. I had a, I had two people, you know, people ask me all the time, how do I get deals? And you know, I'm not marketing or anything. One was from an old realtor that just knows that I close that's integrity. And she's like, Hey, I can't help these people. You know, they're not in my zone. They're out of, out of the area. And they give me the referral and that's the same concept. And the other one was some staff member that used to work for me as a DJ 10 years ago. Hey, you still buying houses? I'm like, absolutely. And he yeah, hooked so that yeah, up too. You think about building a huge referral source that just keeps coming at you. Yeah. And I mean, getting... people keep passing away. People keep needing to unload their assets to cover these crazy costs. And I, Can I, I do a shameless you, plug? Hey, I mean, that's why I have you on the show. <laughs> All right, so if, you, if, you, if you want to learn more about momshouse.com, actually our Facebook page, and that's just mom's house certification. If you go out and search mom's house, you'll find us. Um, there are a couple of podcasts that Philip's been on. Um, some of the larger flip uh, podcasts that, that are out there. You want to hear more details about him and what we're, what we're doing. You can go listen to that. Um, can we get him on your show? Yeah, absolutely. Next week. It's already lined up, daddy. We're, all right, just, all right, we're, we're trying to hang up right now. We're trying to get this over with so I could get Philip on this deal. <laughs> anyway, Ben, listen, Let's, let's, let's wrap this up. First of all, so again, this is momshouse.com. And so go check it out. It's, up, it's a ground floor, up and coming new endeavor uh, from the, you know, Ben and his successful entrepreneur life and with Philip Vincent, right? Is his name? 
Is it Philip Vincent? Yes. Yep. And so these two collaborated and uh, years of experience, not only mining leads, generating leads, that was what you did for Lowe's. And uh, I'm excited to see what you do. So what, what, what advice would you give obviously to uh, try new things, but like what's, what's a book or what would you leave with these young entrepreneurs? That's usually the people that uh, tune into the show. Uh, what would you have done a little bit differently? And then we'll wrap up with what um, I, th I, I think there's, there's a couple of things that I would do differently. And I'll make this real quick. One, uh, there's a book called Profit First. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever read it. Uh, Great no. book. Um, get out and read that book if you're building a business. There's some really amazing ideas there. I think we all get in a trap that we say we've got to keep spending money on marketing and spending money on employees. And we're not paying ourselves what, along the way that we say we're going to get paid at some point. You should be building a business that you're paying yourself the whole time. Come on. So that's a great book. It's an easy read. And if you want to see somebody that has mastered getting you into a digital web, um, it's kind of like Ryan Dice, um, the author of that book, uh, Mike and Michael Lewachowicz or something like that. Um, yeah, you, you opt in for him. You can totally see his book is the top of his funnel to get you in the rest of his stuff. But I say do it. I love getting into people's funnels because yes. it's fun to see what, you to learn. They're, what they're doing there. Um, the other thing is um, uh, Gary Keller did a book called The One Thing. And it's a nice reminder. And it's like, what's the one thing that you can do today that by doing it will make everything else in your life that much better? Hmm. And so I really try to prioritize my time with do I have things that I that, – who's waiting on stuff from me? that I can be getting the leverage of somebody else working on something. So whether that's a, somebody that works for me, it's employee, whether that's a, a VA, I have several VAs that I have that are full time that do menial tasks. If, if I get other people doing those things, it gets them off my plate. My genius zone is I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm a visionary. Um, you know, if you go, if you've ever been through um, Gina Wickman's traction. Um, nice. Yeah. So, you know, I've implemented that Implement, in multiple yeah. companies. Yep. And we integrator. Yeah, I am, I am the visionary and I know I need an integrator. Uh, the Colby index A is amazing to figure out who you are and who the other people are that you work with. It's a test you can go take online, Colby index. Uh, those oh, are some of the things that awesome. I use to kind of dial it. Okay, this, this led into one more question. Since you've <laughs> had this, and I'm out, I'm out, I'm out right here. Okay, because I know you got to roll, I got to roll. You came from the corporate world and then probably majority of your life in the beginning and then you became a super entrepreneur. Was that okay? Would you reinvent that? Would you have not taken those corporate jobs? I, or I, are would, you happy? I would argue that I was still an entrepreneur when I was with, with corporate, um, you know, d getting out and hustling, doing, you know, I had a territory that I had no customers. Let's go, ahead, go out and go create customers. Go, go call hustle. people. Yeah. That's what you're yeah. doing right now. Yeah. I mean, get that's out, what you did out, with go the, hustle, go put it together and, and, um, you know, framework and, and, and building systems and hard work and rolling up your sleeves and just getting out and doing it, you know, get out and make some calls, get out and go do something and see how it changes your energy level. Come on, amazing. make versus, some freaking calls. Yeah, you reached out to me. I mean, yeah. like I, I, I died for you to be on the interview. You were like, Hey, what's going on with you, Van Kalenberg? You got a platform. How could we co connect? There's people in your market that need to buy houses from, sing from, you know, retiring people i mean it's just makes sense like yeah and if you're if it's not the right call. fit for you because you're not experienced enough hey send me an email or come yeah, how do we website. how do we get a hold of you let's wrap up with that okay how, now, how do we uh, it's easy to read it's easy to reach me at ben at momshouse.com b-e-n at momshouse.com feel free to send me an email uh you can find me on facebook love facebook messenger find me on linkedin you can find me i'm easy to find on, this, on, on downtown Kansas City, strolling the streets, looking for your kids yeah, that are only three blocks away. <laughs> picking up money off the streets. To go myself. All right, Ben, it's been a pleasure. Hey, and uh, I can't, so and I can't wait for uh, Philip to come on and uh, talk to you soon. All right. See ya. Broke? Just tired of making chump change? Learn how to improve your income and build wealth with real estate investing. Investor Weekend is here to help you do just that. Join us for a powerful, knowledge-packed weekend that is bound to enlarge your real estate investments. What can you expect to get from the Investor Weekend? Hear great national and local real estate investors. Learn how to buy rental property, build wealth, and connect with other like-minded people for funding, partnerships, and even hot deals. Whether you're a seasoned investor or never purchased a property before, 
You don't want to miss the Investor Weekend. Right now, only $98. Go to www.investorweekend.com now to register or to find out more. Thanks for listening to the Savvy Radio Show. Glide online and listen to our other motivating episodes at SavvyRadioShow.com. Connect on Twitter at LandlordBook and always be buying assets. 